1999, we chose the red pill. The turn of the century moviegoer might recall eagerly partaking in the holiest of humanist sacraments, despite the fact that Morpheus had offered us an alternate exit option. By digesting the blue pill, the story ends, you wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to believe. But no, the red pill. We wanted to stay in Wonderland and see how deep the rabbit hole really goes. The movie in question was The Matrix. It spawned an entire trilogy, and by the first entry's closing credits, just as it was for Neo, our choice poison would have us wake up to our own divine potential. I ditched class with a friend to see it on opening day. It was our senior year of high school. That very month, I skipped another day of public school instruction for Star Wars Episode I, The Phantom Menace, much to our disappointment. But that's another story. In the ensuing years, The Matrix became a point of fixation for esoteric study. The message behind its dystopian depiction of Plato's cave became an instant anthem for my generation. We discussed its deeper encodings in church circles. It practically became a Bible study. We were gullible enough to believe, or rather, deceive ourselves into thinking that Morpheus was a representation of our John the Baptist and Neo, our blessed Lord. But we were delirious because Hollywood is a gangrenous hot tub propagating humanist transmitted diseases, or HTDs for short. Neo wasn't the Jesus who saves us by the atoning sacrifice of his blood alone. Quite contrary, in fact. Neo is the Jesus of esoteric lore who shines the sort of light which might aid and abet us in saving ourselves. The script, which was written then by Lawrence and Andrew Wachowski, aka the Wachowski brothers, both of whom have now completed gender transitions and are known as Lena and Lily Wachowski, aka the Wachowski sisters, might as well have been written by the sun gods Mithras or Apollo. Perhaps it was, because should I have followed the Matrix through to its natural conclusions, I would have been indoctrinated into the occulting mysteries. Let's not overlook other natural perversities of platonic thinking. The Matrix offered legs to the Simulation 32, and worse, revived the Gnostic Demurge, in this case the evil architect, who apparently designed the programmed world which we unenlightened call reality. We Christians know him as our beloved Jehovah, though for the Gnostic, our God is the wicked enslaver of humanity. Much has been written on the Matrix, very little of which I will cover here, and yet knowledge of the mysteries is scarce. So I ask this question, why do the two complement each other as a looking glass of sorts, with exceptionally broad and rather bold strokes? Why, for example, does the oracle, an intermediary between God and man, whom we shall come to learn in a later installment, conspires with the architect? smoke cigarettes, just as the Oracle of Delphi gained her insight from Apollo with the pungent aroma of cannabis. Most conspicuously, the very name Neo, our Matrix Trilogy protagonist, is short for Neophyte. In her how-to book, Nine Life-Altering Lessons, Secrets of the Mystery Schools Unveiled, author and self-described wisdom teacher Kayla Ambrose writes, in the esoteric definition, a neophyte is a student who has just become aware that they may be more than what they previously considered themselves to be. Traditionally, there are seven steps which the neophyte must maneuver, all of which rank among the ascending seven heavens emanating from Plato's globe, and which, by no coincidence, the Matrix skillfully masters. For the mystery school of Mithraism, when the heliocentric model was a religion rather than simply a science, the first degree neophyte was called Korax or Raven in English. Such an inductee exhibits the dawning light of wisdom without having yet peeled back the ever-growing onion peels of his woken competence. 
Just as Neo committed himself to the red pill, Grace F. Notch explains of the Corax Inducti. She writes, It signified likewise a servant, one who gives of his heart totally before receiving admission into the second degree. I can still recall as a moviegoer being enveloped by the red pill, mainly being slayed with wonder by the worldly wizardry which Morpheus illustrated for his Korak student, revealing in no uncertain terms how easy it was for a master to manipulate the supposed reality of the everyday uninitiated. Such is the very first lesson given to the most ancient neophyte, writes Ambrose, we live in a magical universe, which means that the possibilities of what we can create are infinite. Ambrose is quick to affirm, we do live in a magical universe, which listens to every thought we have, every word we say, and every action we take, and it responds accordingly, like a genie following our commands. Should my reader question the mystery school's pledge of allegiance, she furthermore describes this magical alliance as follows. When we activate our consciousness, the all-seeing eye of the universe then becomes aware of us and looks back at us. Its practitioner has become a conscious creator, essentially the I am, working from a higher level and from higher bodies within ourselves. She is talking about Satan. Additionally, as we would come to find with Neo's own breakthroughs, she further quotes, as the all-seeing eye or universe energy becomes aware that you are aware, its energy quickens and vibrates more excitedly with yours. It has no problem keeping up with you as quickly as you are willing to progress. Neo didn't exactly take to his newfound discoveries at first either. A magical reality which is, much like the very world we live in, indistinguishable from technology. Futurist Arthur C. Clarke, who once imagined and cleverly patented the satellite, also compared sufficiently advanced technology as indistinguishable from magic, and C.S. Lewis referred to it as the magician's twin. If I recall, Neo initially wanted out, with such feverish ferocity having regretted swallowing the red pill, that he panicked and altogether pulled himself from the simulation theory construct, which he was expected to bend and shape to his will, only to end up vomiting on the floor, and then passing out. When waking up in the bunk of a dystopian nightmare, he kindly asked his mentor, I can't go back, can I? To this, Morpheus replies, No. But, as moviegoers, we needn't worry too much. Despite his initial reaction, we come to find that Neo couldn't have been discovered at all if he were not first searching, or perhaps more specifically, had he not been ready. Kayla Ambrose adds, As this begins to sink in, your world is turned upside down. Everything you have been taught by society, by your families and your schools, you have just been told that it is not so, not as it appears. At first, you disbelieve and perhaps react with shock and return back to your normal life, thinking that this has all been a ridiculous discussion. However, for many of you, as the old saying goes, when the student is ready, the teacher appears. There are two particular features which mark the minor mysteries, both of which surround the first two acts and final climax of The Matrix. In her book, The Mystery Schools, author Grace F. Notch describes the two successively as a instruction in the deeper sciences of the cosmos which i shall briefly cover and b dramatic rites portraying that which the initiate must go through without outside help in the greater mysteries the second and third degrees are termed crypheus or occult and miles or soldier with each degree Neo is first accepted as a disciple of esoteric lore and then receives sufficient training and purification to become a worker for good. In that order, in fact, the magic of the Matrix 
best functions with the technological downloads which Neo or any other fellow neophyte might instantaneously receive from their occultist brotherhood via transhumanism. For many such technological advancements, should we revel or find our very identities in them rather than the savior, we need only think the occult. The Mahatma letter, letter 24b in Roman numerals, states, Many branches of the arts and sciences were taught in the lesser mysteries, notably geography, astronomy, chemistry, physiology, psychology, geology, meteorology, as well as music, the most divine and spiritual of arts. Perhaps more specifically, and this is important, in Greece and Rome, nearly all the great men of historical note were initiates of one or more degrees of the lesser mysteries. So our techno-punk hackers of the Matrix, Morpheus and Neo, must also glaze humanity with their greatness. Explicitly, their Luciferian servitude is best enacted in their hopes of saving us through disciplined self-saving instructions. Notch continues, thus did these early civilizations ripen in spiritual things under the guidance of initiated philosophers and statesmen, artists, and musicians. Notch describes the fourth degree as the turning or deciding point where those who underwent the discipline and training of preliminary stages are put to the test of actual experience and self-identification. This is the passing from the lower mysteries into the higher. In fact, very few reach such heights of enlightenment, I am told, for lack of discipline. She further adds, of these higher degrees, scarcely anything is known to us. This is natural and indeed appropriate. For how could words describe that which can be understood only by the initiate? For the fourth degree initiate and beyond, termed Leo the Lion among the Mithrian mysteries, no quarter is given. In fact, many do not survive. She writes, in the greater mysteries, the passage into the underworld ceases to be a mere ritual of the lesser mysteries in which the candidate participates. He must now approach the confines of death with full knowledge and in the garment of soul consciousness pass beyond the veil of visible nature into the arena of worlds invisible. Such a meeting with the confines of death is certainly not mere ritual for our protagonist either, because if I'm not mistaken, Neo dies. Here we likely find ourselves in or somewhere bordering the fifth degree. Neo and his fellow occultists form a rescue party to save their teacher Morpheus from the simulated agents of their demurge architect. This degree was called by the Greeks theophany, meaning divine appearance or showing forth of divinity. It is, writes Notch, the appearance or manifestation of man's own higher self to himself. Like any fifth degree mystery occultist, Neo and his fellow Gnostics become divine for a short time. In Fundamentals of the Esoteric Philosophy, G. De Peraka writes, and while in the average candidate, this sublime moment of intellectual ecstasies and high vision lasted but a short time, with further spiritual progress of the candidate, the Theophanic communion became more endearing and lasting until finally, ultimately, man knew himself, not merely as the offspring spiritually of his own inner God, but as that inner God himself in the essential being. In Neo's case, he defies reason by remaining the inner God, despite being killed by an agent of that simulated world's magazine spray of bullets. His name for the record is Agent Smith, Neo's lover and fellow Gnostic, her name would be Trinity, raises him from the dead. Neo, says she to our Antichrist Savior, I'm not afraid anymore. The Oracle told me that I would fall in love and that that man, the man that I loved, would be the one. So you see, 
You can't be dead. You can't be because I love you. You hear me? I love you. This of course is followed by the sort of kiss which might raise the dead to life, whereas Neo likely enters the sixth degree. When our protagonist, who we know now with cinematic certainty as the chosen one, stands courageously before his killer, Agent Smith, he observes not the hallway surrounding him as an unenlightened person might. He sees the various coded numbers and otherwise illegible messages which make up the Matrix's simulated construct. Furthermore, when Neo breathes, so does the Matrix surrounding him. This sixth initiation was called Theopneusti by the Greeks, a word literally signifying God breathing or divine inspiration. Here the master of wisdom would feel the inbreathing from his own inner God and become thus inspired. The very word inspiration meaning inbreathing. Here the master of wisdom would feel, writes Notch, the inbreathing from his own inner God and became thus inspired. The very word inspiration meaning inbreathing. In the seventh but certainly not last degree, which is called theopathy, a Greek word meaning God suffering or divine enduring, the neophyte passes the portals of the sun. Specifically, Neo flies away. Roll in credits. For D. Pirucker, such an esoteric master becomes the wondrous watcher himself. This is no doubt referring to the shadowy brotherhood of astral projection but more precisely the watchers of Enoch's own time. Of this covetous rank, De Perucker adds, it is the most endearing mystery of all. The initiate, the candidate, suffered himself to become, abandoned himself fully to be, a truly selfless channel of communication of his own inner God, his own higher self. He became lost, as it were, in the greater self of his own higher self. For the next two Matrix films to follow, Neo, Morpheus, and Trinity continue their service to humanity as watchers, servants as we know them to be, of Satan himself. Their goal, of course, is to aid and encourage us in the hope of saving ourselves. There is, of course, an 8th, ninth, and 10th degree of initiation, supposedly, writes Notch, while seven were the degrees usually enumerated in the mysteries, hints have been given of three higher degrees than the seventh. But so esoteric would these be that only the most spiritualized of humanity could comprehend and hence undertake these divine initiations. Rare indeed are those who become avatar-like, rarer still, as rare as are the flowers of the Anambara tree, are the Buddhas. Perhaps these final three degrees might be visited in the Matrix's two remaining installments, but Notch warns of any such bystander vision. As for the tenth and last, she writes, such has been left unmarred by description. It is no secret that Truthers love the Matrix, in part because of its techno-punk meets anime visuals, mind-bending bullet sequencing effects, and keyboard warrior mentality but also because, and this is important, it lends personal muscle to their creeds of a humanism without accountability to the Creator, specifically the Lord, and substitutes him with the spark plugs of the inner divine. Can my reader please understand that it is not the elite, the agent Smiths of our world, who are trying to keep us from enlightenment? No, no, the enlightened and the elite are in bed together. Our world is managed and operated by the light bearer and his enlightened people. The watchers still instruct the chosen sons of Cain. Agent Smith, by the way, is only a straw man. Jesus, the real Jesus, the very word which brought all things into being, instructed Adam and Eve to partake of the blue pill. But Adam and Eve wanted to see how deep the rabbit hole really goes. In short, they chose the red.